Mary Hopkin enjoyed tremendous success with her debut single, Those Were the Days, which skyrocketed to number one across Europe and sold millions upon its 1968 release. But the fresh-faced Welsh singer never cared for the song that ushered her into stardom. As one of the first artists signed to the Beatles' Apple Records, she found herself constrained to promote an image at odds with her independent spirit. Join Facts First as we explore why Mary Hopkin hated the song that made her famous worldwide. Those were the days. The song Those Were the Days traces its origins to the 19th century in Russia, first emerging as a melancholy folk tune lamenting times past. It was later popularized in the West through various interpreters. By the 1960s, the song had made its way to London via American folk singers Jean and Francesca Raskin. One night, the couple performed the song at their regular gig at the famed Blue Lamp Club. In the audience was a young Paul McCartney, immediately taken by the nostalgic melody and bittersweet lyrics translated into English. A few years later, McCartney had the idea to record the song with a fresh-faced Welsh singer he'd recently signed to the Beatles' Apple Records, 18-year-old Mary Hopkin. Still buzzing from her victory on the TV show Opportunity Knox, Hopkin journeyed to Abbey Road Studios, where McCartney had crafted soulful string arrangements to enhance the song's wistful quality. Though outside her usual folk style, Hopkin applied her pure vocals, achieving a remarkable maturity. Released in August 1968, Those Were the Days was an instant success, captivating listeners worldwide with its melancholy reflections on youth and experience. Its appeal crossed all boundaries thanks to Hopkins' moving interpretation and McCartney's evocative production. Before long, the single had shot to number one in the UK and across Europe. In America, only the Beatles' contemporary hit Hey Jude prevented it from claiming the Billboard top spot. Hopkins' overnight success transformed her life. She soon found herself on magazine covers and in high demand for television appearances and concerts. Clashing with her image Hopkins' phenomenal success with Those Were the Days had positioned her as one of the most promising new stars on Apple Records. But the label saw her foremost as a fresh-faced teenager and crafted an image focused on her youth and innocence. Promotional material emphasized Hopkins' blonde looks and schoolgirl charm, presenting her largely as a pop product rather than a musical artist. While grateful for the opportunity, Hopkins found the role constraints stifling. Her personal tastes leaned more towards folk styles she had immersed herself in from a young age. Having grown up immersed in Welsh folk music, she aspired to express herself creatively across different genres. But Apple pressed her primarily into the cabaret circuit, singing lightweight pop songs catered towards their marketed vision. As her debut album, Postcard, took on a similar style to the hit single, Hopkin grew discontented, fulfilling expectations of saccharine pop. She voiced frustrations over ceding control to song choices and arrangements not aligned with her voice. While thankful for McCartney's guidance, she also wanted autonomy over her creative direction. Her dissatisfaction heightened on Apple dictating every aspect of her image. Glitzy costumes and heavily promoted live appearances left little room for Hopkin, the artist, to shine through. Over time, she felt more an industry product than musician in charge of her destiny. The grueling performance schedule also began straining her passion for music itself. By her second album, Hopkins strived to free herself from the constraints imposed. She wanted to express her true artistry and connection to folk roots that inspired her journey. However, Apple saw this independence as threatening to their profitable vision. The tensions would escalate Hopkins' disillusionment and her desire to break free of the role she never signed up for. Breaking from the Mold Fed up with her stifled career, Hopkin took control of her creative direction for her second album, Earth Song, Ocean Song. She collaborated closely with Welsh musician Tony Visconti, who had come to understand Hopkins' true artistry and folk influences through their musical partnership. He provided the ideal collaborative partner for Hopkin to break free of her prescribed image and to showcase her talents. In the studio, Visconti crafted stripped-back acoustic arrangements that enhanced Hopkins' voice as the focal point. Gone were the lush orchestrations that had characterized her commercially successful debut. In their place, intimate, folk-tinged backings allowed Hopkins' emotive delivery to shine through unrestrained. 
She picked material for the album that genuinely represented her personal tastes and her inspiration, including introspective songs penned by singer-songwriters like Cat Stevens and Ralph McTell. She exercised autonomy over the album's visuals, opting for a naturalistic woodland theme photographed by her friend Garrett Mankiewicz. It provided a striking contrast to the manufactured imagery Apple Records had previously positioned her with. Upon Earth Song Ocean Song's release in late 71, reviews affirmed it as Hopkins' most cohesive and organic work to date. Her interpretations of tracks like Water, Paper, and Clay radiated with an expressiveness that had been constrained before. But Apple Records remained committed to promoting Hopkins as a commercial pop product instead of the artist she wanted to be. With its low-key musical styling, Earth Song Ocean Song failed to generate major chart success. Relegated to grueling schedules of summer seasons and tours, Hopkin had little opportunity to properly promote the album that articulated her developing identity. She also faced ongoing demands to perform Those Were the Days against her wishes, forced to relive the constructed past she wanted to move beyond. The artistic and personal tensions with Apple Records had escalated sharply. The label was unwilling to support an artist determined to forge her own path, prioritizing profitable pop formulas over her creative fulfillment. Earth Song Ocean Song marked a shift in her sound and her resolute transition into independent terms. She married Visconti shortly after, departing Apple Records to focus on starting a family away from industry demands. Legacy and Later Career while stepping back from stardom to focus on family, her association with Those Were the Days cemented her legacy as one of the era's most promising talents, even if the song didn't represent her true artistry. Its continued popularity through films, television, and compilation albums sustained Hopkin in the public memory. Throughout the 70s, she balanced raising children with sporadic recordings and live performances when circumstances allowed. She contributed backing vocals to albums by Bowie, Janch, and Thin Lizzy, credited under her married name. Hopkin also formed the group Oasis with Peter Skellern and Julian Lloyd Webber, releasing a moderately successful eponymous album, showcasing her developing folk pop style. In the 80s, she remained an in-demand talent for television appearances and charity concerts. She collaborated with Mike Hurst in the band Sundance and recorded with Benny Gallagher. Hopkin also tackled theater, starring in a rock adaptation of Nativity and contributions to George Martin's production of Dylan Thomas's play Under Milkwood. Her daughter Jessica then oversaw reissues of her earlier albums and unreleased material through the label Mary Hopkin Music. This sparked renewed interest in an artist who persevered making music whenever life allowed, long after her prescribed pop star image dissolved. Her 2010 collaboration with son Morgan Visconti, You Look Familiar, won strong reviews, proving she still had the gifts that made her famous despite over four decades outside mainstream exposure. Now in her seventh decade professionally, she maintains an enduring voice that showcases her timeless gifts and evolution as an artist. Now it's time to hear from you. Did Mary make the right choice to distance herself from Apple Records? Let us know in the comments section below.